Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're joined by Nicole and Anna here to talk about mental health and finances. Um, I guess we'll get the presentation started. Thank you for inviting us to present today. Uh, it's actually our first one to the group. So Nicole and I are really excited. Uh, we're here if you have questions, just put it on the chat. Uh, and we'll also provide our information at the end if you have any follow-up questions or are uh, seeking some resources. So I'm Anna Said, uh, and my partner in crime uh, is Nicole Lukowski. And today we will be presenting on mental health and wellness around finances. So this is not a financial financial planning seminar or how to get rich overnight, but it's more about, well, how do we cultivate some good practices and self-awareness uh, to improve our mental health around our financial situation uh, at any given time. So we've already gone through the line and offer at the beginning. Uh, thank you very much for that to the um, presentation team. I just wanted to reiterate that, uh, especially with uh, the pandemic and how we committed learning and how we work and where we play, we could literally be anywhere in the world, but obviously anywhere in the province. So it's really important to uh, acknowledge the land that we are on currently and um, give thanks and recognize that it's a privilege for us to be here. Cool. Okay, great. So thanks so much, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. So myself, I am a patient experience specialist uh, that works at the hospital full time. Uh, I was doing also the vaccination clinic throughout the Hamilton area. And that has now been sort of put on pause, sort of stemming out and <laughs> dwindling out from the pandemic. They're at least a major component of it. I'm also completing my PhD in health management. So concurrently, in, in addition to working at Hamilton Health Sciences, and I do have a background in global health. So I did complete my master's within that. And then I have a bachelor of honors in, in science. So really looking forward to speaking about financial well-being today. Uh, Anna and I have presented in the past, but this is our first sort of alumni series. So feel free to reach out afterwards as well. Our contact information will be there. Um, and Anna, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Thanks. Just to preface, I have this awful, odd cough. It's not COVID. And as far as I've been told, and Nicole confirmed, I don't think I can spread it if I had it through the screen. Uh, but if I turn my video off, it, video off, it's because it's really disrespectful. So just to preface that. Uh, I'm a first year PG candidate. Uh, at studying OB at industrial relations. And my interest uh, in my thesis is actually about unions and the employer um, and how to collaborate together to improve wellness for employees uh, and also uh, related constructs. And I actually came back to school after having received another master's at McMaster in labor relations. And then I also have a higher education master's from McGill. And uh, I'm going to age myself now, but I'm trained as an accountant. So I worked um, in human resources and accounting and finance for the government for over a decade before turning the page uh, into another path, which is education. And so in the last seven years, basically since I was a first year undergrad, uh, I've been working in education spaces. So um, diversity inclusion is also uh, part of my wheelhouse and that's how the mental health uh, part is tied in. Thank you. All right, so for the learning objectives today, again, just to clarify that this is conversation is more about dispelling certain myths uh, about finances. There's actually research, evidence-based research from our uh, School of Business actually, uh, to state and uh, demonstrate that talking about money improves people's not just mental wellness, but also their financial wellness. So like that wealth piece, uh, we're not going to go into that today, but uh, it just, just evidence just for the, the material uh, today and, and the concepts. And we can provide those resources at the end as well. Uh, and we'll all obviously offer guidance and support for individuals who would like to adopt their spending habits. Uh, and we had some cases just to dis discuss a certain scenarios and we would love your engagement. This session cannot be successful without your input um, and uh, participation. We look forward to that and thank you in advance. And then we'll actually introduce uh, like a wellness checklist as well as a toolkit for the next time that you can just uh, grab it. You know, it's a resource that, um, and, and I think Ian will send out some resources afterwards as well to help you alleviate stress and, and prepare yourself um, when you know that maybe there will be some upheaval or when there's discomfort. 
Okay, so based on the survey, so this is what previous individuals from McMaster University had stated. So this is more for your reference in terms of what individuals are feeling or thinking. And this was a study or a short survey that we actually had conducted last year, so in November of 2021. So moving on to the next slide there. So these are some of their survey results. So 100% of the respondents said that they were very concerned that the money that they had um, have or will save will not last them. 60% of the respondents said that they sometimes do things that bring them joy at no cost, but 40% you know, sort of struggled with that. 80% of the respondents said that giving a gift for a birthday, wedding, or other special occasion rarely put a strain on their finances for the month. So that's just to give a little bit of perspective from last fall. And then moving on to the next slide. So we asked, how often do these statements apply to you? So the answers were always, often, sometimes, rarely, or never. And you can sort of say here, so looking at, you know, always in the first question there, so I feel stressed when I think about my finances. So that one was sort of said by some participants. And you can just take a look at some of the other ones there. So, you know, most of you don't feel actually judged surprisingly, but it's what we found as a result of some of the questions that we had asked. But often or sometimes impacted by money does matter. So how does this resonate with you? And does this maybe apply to you and specifically? So I'll just take a moment here and pause to ask you, you know, what are some of your thoughts, at least just to sort of mentally state this in your own uh, means to think about? And so moving on to the next slide. So this is what we heard from you. So these are some of the questions that we had asked with what are you hoping to learn from this session today? So the top four answers that we received and we sort of grouped them into themes were balanced spending for wellness while saving as a career professional. So this is something that we've heard from multiple individuals um, who we had asked this question to. Adapting spending limits while on period of reduced income. So this can be either due to COVID, this can be due to maternity leave, having unfortunately taking time off due to sick leave, coping mechanisms for anxiety and stressors related to finances. So that is something that we are constantly seeing every day. Being in control of spending and payback loans. So unfortunately, payback loans, debt, some of you may be experiencing, it's real and it faces hundreds of individuals on a daily basis. In terms of the next question, so we asked, what are your greatest challenges when it comes to finances and wellness on the next slide? So the top five answers that we received were tracking spending and monitoring. So it's not necessarily just tracking, but what are some of the trends that you may be noticing or some patterns Balancing the need to save versus enjoying life. So that is another that one that we were seeing as well. Having control over finances instead of others. So for example, a partner, a husband, um, can this potentially lead to some marital problems or relationships? And how do you sort of overcome that? Covering basic cost of living or debt, as we had mentioned, and managing anxiety and stress related to different finances. And from the very last question, so what do you hope to take away from today's session? The four top concerns that we had heard are how to optimize savings, alleviating anxiety and stress. So that's a very common theme that we had found, spending and saving, how to balance cost of living versus the income, and how to make better financial decisions and budgeting. So some of these things that we will speak to today. And moving on to the next slide. So many of you are experiencing this, especially coming out of school, whether it be your undergraduate or gra graduate um, designations or degrees, but some of these statistics may be shocking to some of you. So this is in regards to the last couple of years, but 3.6 billion in total amount of loans. Um, this is received Canadian student loans, so quite an exponential amount. You can take a couple moments there just to review some of the other ones. Um, 1.9 million borrowers in direct loan portfolios. You have 100 or 533,000 students that received Canada student grants. So quite significant amounts there. And moving on to the next slide. Um, so again, last year, the point I'm trying to get across here is that you are not alone in all this. So reflecting on your own struggles 
Uh, many of you are also facing the same, or you may have a relative or a friend or a coworker that is also facing the same issue. So this is not uh, outstanding to one individual. It's definitely commonly seen. Anna, so I'm gonna turn it over to you in terms of overcoming some of that financial anxiety. So Nicole and I thought it would be helpful um, and empowering if maybe we share one of our struggles. So for me, um, I had a really good public service job and it's very secure, um, well-paid. And obviously I think money sometimes is not sometimes, it often is associated with status, right? <clears throat> and freedom uh, on all levels. And then I made a choice to go back to school. So it was a shock, but it wasn't because I prepared myself for it. Um, I'm also grateful because I do have a spouse um, who, you know, he assists with the, the day to day. And I think <clears throat> that's where that stress level comes in. Cause I always, I, I'm always like, well, you know, what if he doesn't have a job tomorrow or what if something happens? Like Nicole said, any, anyone at any point can actually have marital problems. So uh, I think being aware and being prepared for that has really helped me uh, through alleviating stress. And I'm still uh, able to enjoy myself. I'm still able to uh, appreciate what I have. And I think culture also plays an aspect. So your family values and, and, and how money, um, I guess, how the value of money was interpreted. And, and also it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what I mean by that is it's actually one of our basic needs. It's, it provides us with some sense of safety and security, but it's relative. <coughs> so one of the, um, my struggles even with some friends is, well, we don't have to keep up, you know, with the Joneses, we don't have to keep up with our neighbors, right? So um, we just have to know where we stand. And I think this workshop is more about that and, and creating that um, comfort level and awareness and as well as the confidence. It's all, that's all integrated. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of share that YouTube video here. Okay. So we're just going to take a one moment to take a look at a video um, in terms of is financial anxiety holding you back? So I ask that each of you just review and reflect on this video as we play it. Have you ever avoided checking your bank account balance because you were just too scared to look? Have you ever had trouble sleeping because you were thinking about bills or money? You're not alone. In fact, a 2018 survey showed that 44% of people reported money as their number one source of stress, beating out personal relationships and job-related challenges. Financial anxiety is a feeling of worry, fear, or unease about your finances. It can be caused by a variety of different reasons, not just a lack of funds. Sometimes it's brought on by other forms of anxiety, like generalized anxiety disorder or math anxiety. It can also be caused by feeling unprepared or maybe just not understanding terms or numbers. The most common reaction to financial anxiety is avoidance. If you can't see your finances, you don't know how bad they actually are, right? However, avoiding your finances instead of managing them can cause them to worsen, which in turn causes more anxiety. So how do you overcome it and break the cycle? Make a plan. What is it about your finances that gives you anxiety? Lack of income, too much debt, or maybe you're secure now, but you're worried about the future. Identify what you're worried about and lay out a plan. Sometimes just having a plan in place can help to lessen your anxiety. Exposure. This one may seem hard since a common reaction is avoidance. However, just reading finance articles or learning a few finance terms each day might help to ease your worries. Think positive. The first step to overcoming something is to believe that you actually can overcome it. Negative thoughts and words only continue anxious thoughts and can even make them worse. Acknowledge your anxiety in writing. Write about what exactly worries you and when you experience those feelings. The simple act of acknowledging may be the first step to overcoming it. Employ relaxation techniques. Stress and anxiety, even financial anxiety, can have physical symptoms as well as emotional. Counteract these symptoms by trying some stress-reducing activities like yoga or meditation. If you're struggling with financial anxiety, you are not alone and you can overcome it. Great. 
So it, it seems so simple, yet so many individuals, you know, do not really take the time to lay out a plan in order to reduce their anxiety. I can't tell you how helpful I, for example, have found reading The Economist. Only a few articles a week have significantly helped me to overcome basic terms that I could then apply back to helping me create a plan. Uh, exercise is also a huge relief for me, so incorporating that into my day has helped, but it's a lot of individuals really do not understand how important it is to create a plan, and improving that literature or that jargon associated with financial burden can be so helpful. Just to add to that as well, um, even like conversation. So I was in Europe uh, this sometime earlier this year, and I uh, spoke sp speaking to one of the, the cab drivers, and he said his career is his personal freedom. And I'll always remember that because uh, you know he's creative in how he um, he's basically selling a skill, right? And so apart from his cab business, so I find that like asking questions uh, and again dispelling those myths around taboo around conversation can really make a difference and um, open up more of a level playing field uh, to have discussions with people from uh, various diasporas. Absolutely. All right. So um, if anybody wants to jump in, we're more than happy even in the chat. Uh, but in terms of, you know, what is a good debt versus a bad debt? Uh, so good debt, I think Nicole and I at least would agree that our furthering our education, uh, advancing our education is there's some debt that like, I know that I've incurred, uh, and I'm sure Nicole you have as a result, or opportunity costs. So the lost income uh, or the lost uh, advancement opportunities, as well as like maybe a pension, seniority, um, those are also financial indicators, right? So it's not just like your tangible money or liquid cash only. And so that could be an example of a, of a good debt. Um, a bad debt could be maybe you actually lent money to someone and they're not going to pay you back, right? And it was difficult for you to not assist them when they needed. Uh, I mentioned that because I was in that situation late, um, very recently and it's a sunk cost for me. Like I know that um, I did help somebody, but in a way it is, it is bad debt and kind of gives that our relationships, for example. But it also could be just a purchase that um, maybe was not necessary at the time. Nicole, I don't know if you want to add anything else or if anyone else has examples they would like to share. No, I think that's great, Anna. I think um, I'll get into some further examples later on. So basically, you know, talking about debt, debt, it's like in terms of reframing debt um, and what has potential to increase your net worth, enhance your life uh, as compared to bad debt, right? Which is also possibly uh, borrowing money from various sources uh, and uh, basically living on credit when it's, um, again, expenditures that can wait. But there's no judgment made in that statement. I just, just we're just trying to give examples and I would love to hear from you as well. Um, but it's also about time um, and other priorities. That to creep up. And so if we have short-term goals, um, it could be that the goal might not be to accumulate, but the goal might not be, might be to not spend a certain way or a budget, for example, your weekly budget for going out, maybe $30 a week, which in this day and age with inflation, you know, it's more like 15, uh, unfortunately. But that that's like, for, for me, that's one of the things that's like, when, I, when I'm with my girlfriends or when I'm with my family, uh, you know what I'm usually I usually spend a lot on them like I'll I'll take my 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 siblings out to supper and stuff but I'm very clear that these are my short term goals and there's only so much I can do right now uh, within my capacity and so the long term goals again this is a saving goal um, is well we know it's about retirement but there could be others as well so it could be something like you want to purchase a property um, and maybe not. Um, jump to, to decision making without uh, being informed and I always find I know I mentioned earlier but just speaking to various um, subject matter experts so it doesn't have to be the real estate agent who has maybe interest right or definitely has some self-interest there um, just according to coming to a workshop like this or webinar uh, where there's like no conflict of interest um, and just needing to understand how those long-term goals can be fostered uh, so another long-term goal um, for me was 
saving for my previous master's uh, and taking time off work. And so I knew I was going to do that. And uh, so how much did I have to save every single month? And then um, budget, like forecast how much I'd be spending. So there's just examples. Uh, I know this, this, uh, this would be wonderful if we could, maybe when we get into the case studies, we can share more together and we could hear from you. Okay, great. So now I will be moving into the strategies. So the first strategy is establishing a time frame. So for example, I want to buy a house in two years from now. So you want to set a particular date for accomplishing shorter term goals and make sure that the goals are actually possible during that time frame. If the goal is not possible, then you will get discouraged. So I cannot stress enough how important it is to establish a time frame. And one strategy that I have found extremely effective is keeping yourself accountable to someone. So share your goal or time frame with it could be a loved one or someone that you trust very well. And usually by keeping yourself accountable, this helps by ensuring ensuring that, you know, you meet your goal and this will improve your, improve your confidence to sticking to your time frame and meeting smaller milestones along the way. So the second strategy is figuring out how much. So let's go back to the example. So you want to buy a house in two years from now. The market is luckily slowly starting to dwindle a little bit compared to what it was months ago. So figuring out how much you'll have to save per week, per month, per year, whatever it may be. So create a time frame again, with how much specifically, and take each thing you want to save for and figure out how much you need to start saving now in particular, right? So you don't want to say, you know, I'm going to start saving in six months time or eight months time. If you have greater expenses right now, you can still start to plan them now as opposed to postponing it. And if the goal is not realistic, adjust your time frame until you come up with a possible or realistic amount. Um, there's many websites, there's many apps that you can also use uh, for free online that if you just type in, you know, let's say you want to save X amount of dollars, it'll help you calculate based on, you know, a weekly, a monthly um, sort of strategy of what you would need to set, spend and based on your income as well. And that takes into account sort of the basic necessity and needs that you may have. So whether you have a rental house income that you need to pay, it'll take into account the number of dependents in your life. So for example, children or if you're take, uh, caretaking for parents or other family members, this can help to really adjust um, sort of your spending habits, but as well, it'll help you to incorporate, you know, how much can you also save or put aside uh, for some of those enjoyments in life that you, you know, don't necessarily want to get rid of. And the third strategy is keeping a record. And you want to keep a record of your own expenses. So what you save, how much you make and how much you spend. So again, using some apps or online platforms can definitely help with that. Um, so I was just doing a quick Google search yesterday uh, out of uh, complete curiosity to know um, what is out there. And there's actually hundreds of different um, free online apps that you can use. And I think Anna has posted some as well uh, in the chat. There are some apps for tracking finances. It's also wise to take a critical look at your expenses. So I personally like using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, some still prefer paper-based and there is really no right or wrong way to keep track of a record, um, but make sure that you use a method that best suits you. So if you don't prefer using online, but you're best suited for paper-based, you know, don't just try to do online for the sake of this if that's not something that you know that you're gonna follow. And in terms of the fourth strategy, so making a budget. So write down a budget so you'll know each month how much you can spend. So setting a goal of, let's say, $30 for coffee, lunch over the next month. Um, and, you know, you have to accept also that sometimes we may go over the budget. In the end, it usually ends out staying on budget. Um, you know, sometimes it may be difficult, but some of those apps or financial trackers can help you stay on goal. And again, that accountability piece, I found myself to be extremely helpful, right? So whether it's your partner or spouse, but someone you trust just to make sure that you're reporting to them in a way that may help you uh, and your long-term goals in the end. And I'm not sure if you wanna jump in or say anything. Yeah, I've just been typing in the chat just for accessibility while you're talking, if somebody else wants to. Um, but I think really for me, what it comes down to is the self-awareness piece and acceptance around the decisions, right? So even with a financial tracker, it's not gonna do magic wonders, 
but it can provide just a sense of like, I guess, a sense of control, right? That it's like a buddy system in a way. Um, Because not all of us will feel comfortable sharing with with a partner or sharing with a friend. Uh, Although that is definitely uh, a good strategy if you do have the people in your life. But uh, some of the apps can also identify bottlenecks. So just put that in there in terms of what are our patterns? We tend to be attracted to the same mistakes, at least I know for myself. Um, and so just that self-acceptance, I think it's important. And I think Nicole and I were chatting about journaling. I think one time, I think, yeah, we had just a conversation recently too that uh, it does have proven benefits. So it doesn't mean that it, uh, uh, you know, you won't fall into the same patterns. And it's also not supposed to be, uh, I guess, a guilty exercise. Just again, it's just about that, uh, like planning and also uh, kind of knowing this is how I might feel. So it's, sort of, it's a protective mechanism, I would say. So we'll just move on to the next slide there. So the discussion question, and I'd encourage all of you to sort of reflect back on this. So whether you want to take a pen and paper and just write this down or jot some notes down on your computer, but what do you think some individuals, or sorry, why do you think some individuals may have a hard time following through on a budget they had set out for themselves? So this is something I just want each of you to think through. And the answers typically may seem very obvious. However, there's a lot of nuances. And as Anna mentioned, there's some bottlenecks that may be creating um, some of these difficulties in following through on a budget and goals. Um, And just to add to that, I think there are certain circumstances which are unexpected in life, right? So... And I think that's happening more and more that at least I see in my, my, small, my smaller circle and also my extended circle uh, where people have planned for something and then something came up and they were delayed in paying their mortgage. So uh, it's not always about, I guess, the patterns, but it's just about those expenses, which can relate to a crisis, unfortunately. Great. And one thing I will add as you're sort of reflecting on this question is if your budget isn't working for you, you need to carefully consider a few things. So your budget may not be working for you for a variety of reasons. And until you figure out what they are, you can't necessarily fix the problem or the barrier. So your budgeting style, for example, may not match the system you have set up, or you could have other issues such as overspending. So I'm heavily involved in the fitness world. And, you know, if we set out goals for our clients to lose, you know, 20 pounds in one week, or, you know, all of a sudden switching to a diet from one day to another, that may not be realistic. We are setting ourselves up for failure and we are setting up others for failure. So really making sure that, you know, your budgeting style is something that will match the system and your lifestyle is very important. And sometimes small starting with those smaller changes, as opposed to overwhelming larger changes can really help to reduce that anxiety. So some people think that making those larger leaps right away can lead to the outcome quicker, but actually we're more likely to fall back onto our old tendencies if we do not slowly start to get into a habit and breaking some of those old cycles that may be detrimental to ourselves. And so moving on to the next slide. So again, answering the question, so why can't I seem to follow my budget? So the first one, is your budget realistic? So often people sit down and they create a budget that just isn't realistic for them. So again, you may set up a number for how much you spend per week on groceries that is too low based on your current lifestyle. Or you may underestimate the amount of gas that you may need per month to commute to and from work and to run errands. So having an unrealistic budget can set you up for failure from the very beginning. And to create a realistic plan for your money, you want to really be sure you consider your um, set major monthly costs. So that can include your rent or your mortgage bills, online monthly subscriptions. Uh, It can be anything from student loan payments, retirement contributions, as well as any discretionary costs such as entertainment related spending. So that way you can form a realistic view of how much you really spend each month, uh, which will help fill in blanks when it comes to evaluating your budget. And the second one, did you cut out all of the fun? So if you have ever slashed out all your spending categories or entertainment options, you may have set yourself up for failure. 
we know that everyone needs some money for fun each month. So you may have to limit it to $20 a month if your budget is really tight, but that small amount can help stop you from blowing your budget by giving up on your budget and blowing hundreds of dollars weekly. So though it may seem counterproductive, uh, this tiny you know, bit of money can help prevent you from feeling deprived, which can lead to overspending. And the third one, is it a matter of self-control? So another reason why you budget, your budget may not be working is that lack of self-control. So if you love to shop, splurge on nice meals or pamper yourself, you may have a harder time sticking to a budget. So try writing down your financial goals and carrying them around with you, let's say in your wallet or purse. So I have a little card that I keep with me in my wallet that I can sometimes look at just as a reminder. And as you pull out, you know, your cash or your debit card and you look at these goals, um, it may help to remind you of the reason that you actually have a budget in the first place. And also you can try to avoid the stores or situations that lead to different spurges, right? So those are some of our urges that kicked in. And you may also be wasting money without realizing it. So be sure that you're not buying things that you do not use or need. Um, you can also make a specific list of things you need to buy and lead and for how much before leaving the house. This keeps you mindful of having a specific project and you're not sim simply shopping just for no mission in mind, essentially. The fourth one is, is budgeting just too much work. So again, tracking your expenses, evaluating your spending and just balancing your checkbook or your bank account. Um, you know, if you simply can't find the time to do this, then try the envelope budgeting system instead. So you can also consider switching to a cash only budgeting system to cut down on the time involved. Um, again, managing your expenses, using an app if that's helpful. The fifth one, do your financial goals seem unattainable? So we've talked a lot about this one already today. Um, so if you're working to get out of debt, but you know it will take a year or two, then it may be difficult to stick with that plan. So avoid this by setting up milestone markers along the way, which can be extra motivation as well to help stick to your budget. And then you can also reward yourself too. So if you're setting these little mini goals for yourself, right? If um, let's say if you avoid eating out during the week, you may reward yourself with a nice dinner out uh, at the end of the month, for example. Or if you manage to tuck away a thousand dollars into your savings, you may reward yourself with a new outfit. Now, of course, that doesn't cost a thousand dollars, but <laughs> you know, sort of smaller rewards along the way. And the last ones, are you forgetting anything in your budget? So it's important to include annual expenses like family vacations, summer camps, or medical expenses in your budget. Um, you can also set up a sinking fund uh, with this expenses and some of the apps will talk about what that is. Um, but basically what it is, is you should also set up a category to cover irregular spending, like the cost of attending a friend's wedding, for instance. So these unexpected expenses may not count necessarily as emergencies, but it's important to plan for them so that you don't derail your budget. Okay, so next is Anna moving into financial self-care and mental health. So I think we mentioned um, peer pressure. So I just want to take a moment again. Whose dream are we chasing, right? And I think as Nicole mentioned earlier, in terms of um, knowing where we are and what our priorities are and even identifying those bottlenecks um, is very important. And preparation for anything, right? So if you're on a road trip, and you don't have a map, you don't know where you're going, and there's, um, you know, an unexpected situation, uh, something happens to your tire, you're going to be more distressed if you're not prepared, right? So I just use that analogy. It's just a very common one. I find that uh, if we're going to uh, uh, create a path to, to improvement in our financial wellness, it's part of the, the, the greater wellness wheel, right? So the physical the mental, the financial, which are still separated, obviously, and distinct, uh, and then spiritual, right? So <clears throat> I know I was talking to a friend the other day, and she uses a lot of spiritual tools. Uh, I'm going to share that in the chat in a few minutes, but it's really cool. It's about um, just in terms of, I guess, accessing if you have, whether it's through yoga or through prayer or through your faith or through your creed, um, in terms of maybe traditions, 
and uh, creating a uh, space for meditation, for example, right? It's around your financial self-care. And the other key one, so that's, that's the first one on the slide. I just want to leave it, that one for the, for the end because it's, uh, it's more about the action and then how we implement it. It's around how, what are other ways, right? Because obviously any society we live in, um, regardless of, uh, of culture or nationality or location or occupation, we can't survive without money. So that is the media of exchange, right? For any goods and service. Um, and so perhaps, you know, we bring back barter, which people are doing now. Like I might provide, provide tutoring to a peer for one subject, um, not charge for it while they provide tutoring to me for another subject that maybe I'm weaker at, for example. Uh, and so in terms of creating that, that happiness, are, is there other ways uh, that we could derive that from, right? So I think that's important in terms of um, like, you know, what about having a friend over for coffee? So something as simple as that versus uh, going out for a cappuccino or going out for a drink. You know, I mean, we all know the markup on alcohol uh, if we drink, right? So if maybe, maybe just go into someone's home instead. Uh, going to a picnic, right? So there's other creative ways where we could possibly derive the same benefit, but just through uh, uh, a different medium, or right? a different path. Uh, and I think that also helps to, to create that powerful shift uh, and, and just create sort of, uh, you know, where we are status quo and, and open up that conversation with, uh, with our, our circle, whether it's the, our immediate circle or the other circle. So I think... There's some strategies there. Anything else, Nicole? I don't know if you want to add anything from personal experience or. No, I think that's great. And I think um, you provided quite an array of examples there. Thank you. All right. So next slide. I can't see the slide. Okay, perfect. I can see now. So some of the key ingredients, um, just like we would for our physical fitness, for example, for me, uh, I have a gym routine, right? And I know during COVID that obviously changed because I couldn't go to the gym anymore. So it's just like that. Uh, with anything else and anything in life, I guess, or any goals that we have uh, or any way that we self-care, you know, it, are there ways to improve our relationship with that topic, right? So I think some of the key ingredients we, we spoke about was the planning part, um, meditation, right, around financial anxiety, there's one that Ian will share with you at the end. I think he may have already in the invitation, but if not, I will recirculate it. Uh, and establish some of those habits and the strategies. I think one important point to emphasize as well is I think being haphazard about certain decisions leads to more distress. And so even though we may not be able to control everything in our pocket, in terms of liquid money or our assets, uh, financial wealth, we could create better wealth with our mental health, right? And there's a lot of control we have over that uh, to, a great, to a great extent. So uh, the habits uh, nowadays, like strategies like an app or a tool, the relationship with money and what we associate with that. There's even some free like courses online through MOOCs, uh, which are massive open online courses. Uh, where it's like helping you identify, right? So self-awareness about, well, where did I get this value from? Or um, where did I pick this up from? Or this idea or this ideology or philosophy around money. And acquiring more and more, there's actually, uh, again, data to say that acquiring more and more has an inverse relationship with happiness. So I think just being aware of that too is, is key. Uh, I think the video could be a good time for the video now. As the saying goes, money makes the world go round. You need it for almost everything, and it can be extremely stressful to make sure you have enough to cover everything. Financial wellness involves taking control of your finances so that you can lessen this stress. As a college student, you might have a lot of expenses that cause you financial stress, such as paying for school, housing, bills, and food. You may even be taking care of someone else. It can be difficult and overwhelming to keep up with all of these expenses, but ignoring them can just make you feel even more anxious. 
Financial wellness means developing smart financial habits and finding ways to manage these expenses and your overall financial situation so that you can feel less stressed and have enough money for what you need. So, how can you build financial wellness? There are many things that you can do, but here are some suggestions. Compare prices at different stores and look for deals. You can use apps like Flip to browse flyers for local stores, see what items are on sale, and make a grocery list. You can even search for specific items to find the sales. Meal plan. Plan your meals for the week based on what is on sale. Price match one item. If you have a flyer saying that an item is on sale at another store, some retailers will match that price at their store. Examine your spending. Write down every single thing that you buy in a week and evaluate where you can cut back. You can download a budgeting app for help tracking everything. Make a weekly and monthly budget. Figure out how much money has to go to fixed expenses like transportation and rent, and then plan how much of what's left over you can spend on other things. Take advantage of a student discount. Some retailers and services offer discounts for students. Do some research before you make purchases to find out if you could get a discount. Make a present or card instead of buying one. If you have skills such as painting, baking, jewelry making, crafting, woodworking, or knitting, you can use those skills to create personal gifts instead of spending money. Use loyalty point systems to your advantage. Many stores have loyalty programs that allow you to earn points towards future purchases. Try a few of these suggestions to improve your financial wellness. So hopefully those provide some insightful thoughts. Yeah, so we're almost at the, uh, the conclusion point, but this is just a guide and it's a guide for journaling. Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier, uh, as well as just a self check-in and reflection. Um, if you really, really have, because um, people have different ways of, you know, obviously achieving self-care. And uh, so this, it could be in writing, it could be even visualizing. So you could add activities to visualize. Uh, so anyways, it's in here. Uh, we can provide the actual PDF uh, created uh, like a Word document. So feel free to reach out. I'm going to put my email and Nicole's email on the chat. Okay, so moving into some examples of unexpected expenses. So do not touch your emergency funds unless it's absolutely for a crisis. Um, take from the pot for these reasons. So um, some of these may include, so medical emergencies, if you have a pet or family issues, major auto repairs, unexpected home repairs, unplanned travel for emergency, or an unexpected gift expense. So sometimes we look at those for funerals or for others. So these are just some types of unexpected expenses that oftentimes we overlook and, and we do not save for adequately, or we do save for them when we think to ourselves, what are the odds of these actually happening? And then we'll sort of start to take from this pool slowly and slowly until we realize when the time actually comes, unfortunately, that um, some individuals may not be well equipped um, for that type of budget or finance expense. So these are just some uh, examples of things that you should always have an emergency budget, even though that may be taken away, you know, from some other parts, but it really does come in handy, um, you know, from least expected times. And I believe that that concludes our conversation um, for today. Anna had posted um, our email. So, you know, that'll be sent to the group as well afterwards, along with some of the resources that we have presented about today. Um, and as well, some of those additional links that you will be able to access on your own time. But I just challenge each of you to sort of think back to some of the questions that we had asked today, and hopefully that this provides some additional um, perspective and even incentive to look at finances in a different way uh, in order to improve your well-being and some of that mental alertness and awareness uh, that each of you may be having. Great. So I think that that concludes our presentation for today. And I'm not sure if you have any, any closing remarks.
just the resources. Uh, we'll, we'll just be circulating those. And yeah, I've provided us with you with both our emails. Just feel free to reach out anytime.